Miso soup with tofu. How would you like a small bowl of miso soup to go with your next Japanese meal? I know that I would. And in fact, if you've never made it before, or if you have, it's actually one of the simplest and tastiest soups that you can make at home. And in this video, you're gonna discover five mistakes to avoid doing next time you make a bowl of miso soup so that it turns out a delicious and aromatic success. If we haven't met before, my name is Pat Tokuyama. I help people learn how to make plant-based Japanese food. If you like this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up now or before the video ends because it really helps my channel grow and reach more people just like you. And if you're interested in video cooking lessons and learning how to make plant-based Japanese food, make sure to check out the links in the description below for more info on my cookbooks and cooking programs. So the first mistake that you can avoid quite simply is to understand just a little bit about what it is that makes miso, miso and the differences between different types of miso. So the first thing that I wanted to talk about was the color. So red and white miso are the two common colors that you're going to be seeing most often at your local Japanese supermarket or on Amazon. And red miso may not necessarily appear as red as a valentine red. It's more of a brownish color. The other most common type is going to be white. White gets its name because it looks a little bit lighter in color. It's more of a tan uh, off-white or creamy color. And the difference between the two is that red is going to be more robust, more salty, more uh, bold in flavor. On the other hand, white miso is going to be a little bit sweeter, a little bit less salty, and a little bit more mild in terms of flavor. So as you can imagine, those two differences are going to naturally call those two ingredients towards different uses and different types of dishes. But if you're in a pinch, in a pinch, and you only have one, you are able to substitute white miso for red miso um, and make a few adjustments in terms of maybe adding some sugar or sweetener to offset some of the saltiness of the uh, red miso or maybe add a little bit of seasoning such as salt or shoyu or soy sauce to white miso to make it a little bit more savory. So now that we've got the colors out of the way, the second thing that you need to know is the different types of uh, ingredients that are used. So the most common ingredients that you're going to see in miso are going to be soybeans, uh, barley, as well as rice or uh, wheat, plus a variety of other combinations of ingredients as well. In addition to that, you can also find miso paste that is labeled in Japanese with the kanji or Japanese characters, which you probably wouldn't be able to read, but you can look right here and this is what you're going to be looking for. Yuki is going to mean organic. It's the same thing as USDA organic, but J Japan has its own organic, uh, I guess, uh, labeling system and it's usually JAS. Uh, or you can see the kanji there. In addition to that, you can also look for something that says koksan. Koksan means that the food or the product was made in Japan, and generally that's considered a higher quality product. So when it comes to food, that means the food ingredients, for example, the soybeans or the rice or whatever, was uh, produced and harvested in Japan. So in general, yuki and koksan are gonna be two things that you might wanna look for in terms of uh, Japanese characters on the labeling of the miso paste because it tends to denote uh, higher quality. At least to me, that's what I look for. So now you know a few things about miso. Next time you're at the market, make sure to look for those things. The second thing that you might want to avoid doing or not doing potentially is adding dashi. Some of you may know that uh, dashi is important in terms of adding flavor, adding umami, and bringing out the natural flavors of the food that you're using it with. But when it comes to miso soup, sometimes miso paste already has dashi in it. In that case, you don't necessarily need to be making dashi and adding it to your miso paste because you're gonna just overdo the dashi and it's gonna turn out potentially a little bit on the fishier side if you're sensitive to that. And it's kind of a waste of your dashi because you don't necessarily need it since it's already in the uh, miso paste. So it's kind of like adding chicken stock and a chicken bouillon cube to the chicken stock, if that makes any sense to you. The other thing to remember, on the other hand, is if your miso paste does not have dashi, you need to add dashi to the miso paste. It's not going to taste good if you just use water. No dashi equals no good. If your miso soup tasted off, perhaps it was missing some dashi. And don't worry just yet if you are trying to be plant-based and you have concerns about eating dashi that has fish products in it, uh, you can actually make the vegetarian kind, which is made with uh, mushrooms and or kombu. So shiitake mushroom is one of the, the more common ones as well as kombu or kelp uh, which is a type of seaweed uh, or you can use a combination of those two together as well as other ingredients for your vegetarian or plant-based dashi. 
And if you're interested in learning more about plant-based dashi, like kombu dashi and shiitake dashi, make sure to check out the videos and the links in the description below. So the third mistake that you want to avoid is if you are in a rush or you didn't necessarily plan out what you're going to be doing tonight to make your miso soup is timing. Uh, as you know, uh, certain vegetables may take longer to cook than others when you want to put them in uh, a soup, for example, you might want to cook those hard vegetables, root vegetables in particular, carrots, daikon radish, denkon gobo, which is a burdock root, uh, so that they get soft and palatable once it's time to eat them. So typically what you want to do in terms of timing is make the dashi first, uh, cook them or soften them either by sauteing them, steaming them, microwaving them, or parboiling them so that they're softened. And then the last thing that you're going to be doing is adding the miso paste. It's always the last thing. So another thing to consider in terms of timing is if you're going to be using dried ingredients, so like dried shiitake, for example, that's going to take some time to rehydrate and release all of its good umami compounds. Uh, in addition, we have our wakame, which is a dried seaweed, uh, maybe dried onions if you're using that, dried mushrooms if you're using that uh, are going to take time to rehydrate and get nice and plump and juicy almost to the way that they were when they were originally harvested. And if you don't rehydrate those things separately, and if you just add them to your soup pot, you can do that, but know that it's gonna concentrate your soup as they absorb the liquid out of the uh, dashi base. So you might be wondering why I said the timing in terms of cooking the vegetables and making sure that they're soft is important. Well, here's why. You don't wanna boil your miso because when you boil your miso or you cook it for a long period of time, it's gonna lose its aromatic character, its aroma. It's a sensory adjective ver form of sensory experience uh, eating. So as you may know, 30%, it's said 30% or so of taste is smell. So you wanna protect the aroma of your miso because that's part of the experience. And if you don't, uh, by boiling it off, if you're cooking it for a long period of time and just leaving it uncovered after it's done cooking and it's still super hot, you're still losing that aroma because it's being released into the air. Thus, that's why you can smell it. When you wanna add the miso paste, it's at the very end. Once you're done cooking all your vegetables, just before you're about to serve it, you wanna stir it in. They have a special miso strainer or you could just use a fork or a whisk to break it up quickly and then it's ready to serve. And if you're not ready to serve it, just make sure to cover it with a lid. And so that's the fifth mistake that you may or may not be making is leaving your miso soup uncovered after you're done cooking it or after you've served it on a table and you're not yet eating. So if you've been to a traditional Japanese restaurant, you may have noticed that sometimes the miso soup uh, comes covered with a lid uh, when it's brought to your table. And that's the whole reason or the rationale for doing so. It's to protect the aroma. So if you're leaving things uncovered, the aroma, if you can imagine all of the miso aroma is kind of like a, a little puppy, and uh, if you're gonna leave that little puppy unleashed, it's just gonna run away, potentially not being trained just yet. And then you're losing about 30% of your miso experience. Now, I guess you tell me, are you the type of person who would settle for just 70% of your miso experience? Or would you want the whole 100% of your miso experience? No judgment. Whatever uh, you prefer, I guess, is totally fine with me. So let me know in the comments if you have a good doggy problem or a bad doggy problem in terms of your uh, miso aroma and that being lost or not into the atmosphere. And also let me know what you think of this video so far with a uh, thumbs up if you enjoyed it or a thumbs down or a comment to share your feedback. So a little bonus here, I know that we talked about five things to avoid doing and when next time you make your miso soup, I'd be curious which one you're gonna be trying first. Let me know in the comments or if I missed anything, let me know as well. But I did have a couple bonuses for you. One is gonna be miso soup, just like the otsukemono that we talked about and the brown rice that we talked about in the last two videos are made in general with whole food plant-based foods. Whole food plant-based foods, as you may know, are the foods that have shown benefit in terms of your health over the long term. And if you're interested in learning more about that, make sure to check out the links in the description for some of my training. So now you know five different things to avoid doing next time you make your miso soup at home. And in the next video, we're gonna be expanding our knowledge on rice, otsukemono, and soup, and maybe even talking about some side dishes, also known as okazu, or fukuzai, which is uh, vegetable dishes, as well as maybe even something like an entire or a complete meal, a traditional meal that is plant-based. So stay tuned for that. And 
I guess before we go, some of the things that I wanted to also cover really quick to make this a complete guide for your miso soup adventures. Uh, some of the most common ingredients that you could use uh, in terms of making your miso soup uh, is pretty much anything uh, and everything, almost. So as you can imagine, it tends to be on the savory, saltier side. So you're not necessarily going to want to be putting things that are sweet in there, but you can. So for example, things like kabocha squash, you can use that. That's just one thing. So some of the other things uh, we wanted to cover, I wanted to cover with you, uh, you might be familiar with, you know, seaweed, wakame and tofu and green onion, which is going to be pretty common in terms of what you see, at least here in America at Japanese restaurants. Now, let's break it down. In terms of the ingredients that you can put into your miso soup, depending on the season, of course, uh, are going to be as follows. So starting with some root vegetables, we have uh, daikon radish. We also have onion. Is onion a root vegetable? I guess not. It's more of an aromatic, but you can use onion. Uh, we also have carrots as well as gobo or burdock roots. Uh, Rencon, which is lotus roots. So you want to make sure to cook those so that they get nice and soft. We also have some leafy greens, so you can put in uh, lettuce. Uh, spinach, mizuna, which is a type of uh, Japanese leafy green, komatsuna, which is similar to uh, spinach, chard, you can put in kale, uh, as well as shungiku or chrysanthemum green. As far as uh, baby greens, you can put in some kaiwara daikon or maybe some of your favorite uh, radish sprouts. Uh, or moyashi, which are bean sprouts or other types of microgreens if you enjoy growing those and using those in your cooking. Some other fruits that you can put in include tomato, cucumber, okra, uh, eggplant, zucchini. Other vegetables that you can use in, in addition to what I just mentioned, those three categories include things like takenoko, which is bamboo shoot, uh, corn, uh, you can also put in beans, so any kind of white bean are what I prefer as well as chickpeas, you could put in soybeans, both the dried kind that has been rehydrated or the green kind, edamame. Green beans work well, snow peas, snap peas, sugar peas, green peas, as well as tofu's uh, brothers and sisters, which is yuba or tofu skin, as well as aburage, which is deep fried tofu skin. And if you want things a little bit more aromatic, consider putting in things like onions, whether they're green, white, red, or yellow. Japanese herbs like mitsuba, which is a Japanese parsley. You can also put in shiso, which is perilla or uh, sesame leaf, as well as sancho pepper. Myoga, which is uh, similar to ginger. Uh, you can also put ginger in as well and use it. And if you want a little bit more protein or nutrition to make it a little bit more filling, you can put in something called fu, which is a wheat gluten. It's processed, but it's like concentrated uh, gluten, so it has a little bit more protein and starch and fiber and all that stuff in there. It's a great way to add some more, I guess, substance or depth to your soup. Uh, it's nice and thick. Perhaps that'll be the uh, topic of one of my future videos. So if you haven't subscribed yet, make sure to do so right now by hitting the little button over here. Tap to subscribe and make sure to check out the video right here in the next video and the links in the description. If you haven't already, give me a thumbs up to let me know that you enjoy this video so that others like you will be able to find it and subscribe as well if you haven't already for more plant-based Japanese cooking videos like this one today. Jana, bye bye. It's a very, very, very rich and sensory. It's a very uh, sensory, 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 trying to... What's the adjective uh, word for sensory? Help me out, leave me a comment, which is going to be too late because this is going to be after I'm done recording. But anyways, it's a very, it's a very... Uh...